So now let's have a look at the flow file. I'm going to open up my unsteady flow data and I've got my boundary lines, my boundary condition lines in here right now. Um, one handy thing that you could do um, in the geometry viewer that's not quite as handy in RAS Mapper is to measure the slope of your line. Now you're supposed to grab the energy gradient, but at this point I'm just going to estimate what the energy gradient will be by going into my geometry and measuring using control on my keyboard, measuring what the alignment is. If I cross the channel here and up here uh, in a couple of places and just double click, I'll get a uh, menu item here that allows me to cut from the terrain profile. And if I cross that channel and roughly follow the channel and measure again holding control down, uh, from this channel to this channel right here, um, I should get a decent uh, representation of the slope. In this case, it's about 1%, so that's what I'm going to use. I'll enter that 1% as the outflow boundary condition for my normal depth. I'll also need to enter a slope for the inflow, and I'll measure that the same way here. We can get more accurate with this later on, but as I cut this profile, I went from the channel up over a hill, and essentially that slope from low point to low point um, is just over 1%. So I'm going to bring it in at 1.5% on the inflow, bring it out at 1% on the outflow. So I'll exit back out of the geometry viewer and um, go ahead and start entering my boundary conditions here. So on the downstream end, my uh, BC line here, which I'll have to remember to rename to the downstream outlet, uh, is going to get a normal depth slope. And again, the downstream I think was going to be 0.01 or 1%. And for the inflow at the top, I'm just going to give it a hydrograph with zero flow at the moment. And the reason I'm going to give it zero flow is because at first I'm going to run a rain on grid model over the top of this thing. So at the upper end, just so I'm ready for this one when we run it, I'm going to give it a 1.5% slope and it only has a one hour duration and it's zero flow. Now if I'm going to run this as a rain on grid model, I'm going to need to take my 2D flow area and make a boundary condition out of it. That's going to be a precip. Now at this point, I'm gonna show you a handy little tool that I've made for uh, developing a what's called a frequency storm. If you're in Australia, the Bureau of Meteorology publishes IFD data, and you can see that right here. I've gone in and put in the coordinates for this project, and now I've got all of my intensities, frequencies, and duration. I'm going to copy these numbers, and then I'm going to go ahead and paste them into a little spreadsheet that I've made that allows me to develop what's called the frequency storm. Again, it has every worst case duration, frequency, and intensity. So I'm going to paste these numbers in. And once I've got these numbers pasted in, it's going to develop for me a spreadsheet that shows the intensity storm. And now when I go into this spreadsheet, it will give me uh, this frequency storm. Here's a one hour storm that's going to have the worst case of everything built into it. So here's my one hour storm. I'll go ahead and copy those values and paste them into my uh, unsteady flow file. These were at one minute uh, duration or uh, time interval and when I paste these in, I can plot the data to make sure I've got the frequency storm represented. Again, this is the worst one minute you'd ever see here, the worst five minutes, the worst 10 minutes, the worst half hour, and the worst hour. So that's the storm that I'm going to rain on this catchment. So the next step is to make a plan file. Here's my unsteady plan. As always, we do one, two, and four. We have no sediment data. Um, for my time frame, I'm going to choose a date well off in the future so that I know it's a simulation and not a calibration. I'm going to choose the same day for the end date and make it one hour of a storm. For my time step, I'll go ahead and pick five seconds just to make an initial guess. We'll check that with current number criteria later on. The remaining ones I'm going to call one minute each. And with that, we should be just about there and ready to run our rain on grid model over the top of this. I'm going to save this with a new name and I'll call this uh, Gold Creek Direct Precipitation. Remember the short ID is very important. It becomes the labels on your uh, charts and it also becomes uh, the folder name for your results. So again, Gold Creek um, Direct Precip. And I realize I forgot to save my unsteady flow file with a name, so I'm going to give this one a name first. This is going to be called Gold Creek Direct Precip as well. With that saved, I should be able to uh, 
find both of those, save the plan, and we're good to go. Now when I hit compute, um, I just uh, while it's computing, remember always, always, always put something in the plan description. I've left that blank. I never like to leave those uh, fields blank because you think you might remember later on what you were doing, but it's going to be hard to remember um, once you've run sometimes dozens, sometimes hundreds of plans in a given model. So it looks like this one ran through in a fairly short amount of time. Uh, this one got through in 25 seconds. Any reasonable um, direct preset model should probably take hours, if not days, to run um, to get any good resolution out of it. Um, you probably want to run it at your LiDAR resolution accuracy, if at all possible, uh, because again, these grids are defining sheet flow paths that are coming down fairly steep slopes. Um, it's going to be something that uh, can give you pretty re erroneous results when your grid sizes get way too large. So now I'm going to close out of this and go back into RASMapper to have a look at our results. And I can turn these on now and watch my rainfall depths. Or sorry, my runoff depths. Um, as I bring this around, I'm going to animate this and have a look at uh, the flow paths. Let me turn off the geometry so you can see what's going on underneath it. And you can watch the flow accumulate and uh, recede at the end of the hydrograph. So now let's go in and see what happens here. If we can extract a hydrograph uh, from the profile line that we had defined, and you can see the line right here. As we click on this one and I plot the time series, I'll get the flow, and you can see a nice smooth hydrograph. My hydrograph peaked right here. Uh, my hydrograph is peaking 10 minutes later, which uh, makes me think that we've uh, probably underestimated our roughness um, or we have some other issues. I don't think this thing would have responded in 10 minutes flat. In any case, for this purpose, we'll go ahead and go to the table and grab that hydrograph value, which we are now going to insert into our unsteady flow file. So I'll copy and paste this um, straight from the table into my unsteady flow file as the boundary condition. I'll close out of that, go back sorry, to my unsteady flow file. And on this flow hydrograph, where before I had zeros, I'm now going to go in and paste in the values that I've just extracted, pull them in as one minute hydrographs or uh, time steps and say, okay. Um, sorry, I always mean to check the data to make sure that we don't have any typos in there and I think we're good to go. So with that, I'm actually now going to delete my uh, rainfall, the precipitation on this and just bring it in as internal inflow. So I'm gonna click on this one and delete my boundary condition, take out my storage area. Now I only have two boundary conditions, the inside and the outside. And I'll go back now into my unsteady flow plan and we'll rerun this one. I'll hit compute again. And now with this computation, it should run a little bit quicker because not all the cells are wet. So again, what I've just done is let it rain on the whole catchment and now I'm extracting a hydrograph from that rainfall runoff model essentially and using that as my inflow boundary condition. It runs fairly quickly again, um, but once this is over, I'll go ahead and click on RAS Mapper and have a look at our results. So I'll exit out of this, go into RAS Mapper, and let's have a look at our results. You'll notice that before I had uh, rainfall coming everywhere from the side slopes and from the sheet flow areas. Uh, now I've only got rainfall or runoff in the channel itself. But again, one thing to watch out for, if you turn on the profile line, you can see what's going on here. You're gonna be able to have flow going both directions and uh, the flow is gonna travel upstream and downstream. So I've got, got some minor instabilities in there up in the upper end. First, let's zoom out and have a look at this model again. Um, what I've got now, if I turn on my geometry, is inflow that has been introduced in the middle of the model, which you weren't able to do before. If I wanted to do this uh, in version 503, I would have had to take this external boundary and slice it to uh, coincide with this inflow location. But before signing off, let me just have a look here again at uh, what it looks like in your animation. Uh, floods coming and going. And when I go back to the unsteady flow options, uh, this is something I forgot to highlight earlier. You have a few additional options that we didn't have before, and um, that's on these boundary conditions. You have a tailwater check, and you also have a couple of places where you can enter some additional criteria about the uh, distribution of that flow.
Now a few things to check that you can't do in RAS Mapper as easily as in uh, the Geometry Viewer. One of those is something you always want to do when you're entering in boundary conditions, and that's to plot the terrain profile underneath that BC line, and you can make sure that it's a good cross section and doesn't dip off to one side. Another thing over here, when I plot this one, you'll see that I had a split flow right here, which is why it's being brought in in a couple of different places. I should bring it in here or here separately, but uh, bringing it in together resulted in some of those instabilities as the flow came back together. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this little tutorial on uh, internal boundary conditions in HECRAS 5.0.4. I'll probably try and clean this up a little better later on, but let me just get this out there. And uh, in the meantime, hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, tune in for another one and give me some feedback. Uh, on what you'd like to see covered in future videos. Thanks.